to your name, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Come on, lift up your voice and give him a shout of praise. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Father, we worship and glorify and magnify you in this house. We thank you that you are great and worthy of all praise and honor and glory. We lift you up in this house. This is your habitation. Manifest yourself among us, Lord. Have your way in this place. Hallelujah. Just say it out loud. Father, I want everything that you have for me. Everything you've planned for me. I want it all. In Jesus' name. I begin to thank and praise him for that. Hallelujah. I want it all. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. There's someone, I think you're present, you may be watching, but I sense, I see uh, this, it's, it looks like it's a, well, it's a deep pain. It's on one side of your head in the back, and I don't know if it's vertebrae or if it's a growth, but there's some physical challenge that you have and it causes terrible pain, stiffness, can't move your neck, and then it shoots around the front of your head with this headache. And uh, the doctors really don't know what to do. I sense there's been something that they've suggested, but you're not sure. At any rate, I just see this person in pain right now and I just want you to know the Lord is here to heal you today. He is here to heal you. I mean, it's just as real before me right now praise God and so if you're here in this service now there's people watching online and there's people in the other room but if you're here in this service and that describes you would you lift your hand up so I can see it right now anyone in this place right now want to pray for you okay okay come on forward real quick I just want to pray for you praise the Lord don't be ashamed or embarrassed we're just going to take a moment Oh, couple folks. Okay, come on. Praise the Lord. Bless you. Praise God. So tell me about where does it hurt? I've, I've had migraines for the last 10 mm -hmm. years, and yesterday was one of the most painful moments. I went and got a, get a shot immediately, and I was with my brother, and he said, it feels like the pain is, is just Does it start in the back of your head? It, it radiates. It radiates all over. Okay, from from the back to the front, or from the front to the. I've had aneurysms. Okay. And it, it shoots. Well, isn't it wonderful that Jesus is here to heal you today? Isn't that wonderful? So just lift up your hands and say, "Lord, I receive it." In the name of Jesus, Satan, loose this woman and let her go. Spirit of infirmity, leave and never return. Never come back in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. We thank you for total healing of these migraines and this condition that, Lord, these aneurysms, whatever the source of them are, we command the damage to be reversed in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. We believe it's done. Now testify it. All right. Praise God. Hi. Okay, do, tell me where the pain is. It shoots right back here on one side of your head and um, on this side. Yep. Okay. And uh, you went, you're going to a neurologist, they said, and you, they don't know what it's from. Are you ready for the Lord to heal you? Are you in pain at all right now? No. It aches. Okay. In the name of Jesus, Satan, take your hands off this woman. Be made whole right now in the name of Jesus. Ooh, thank you, Lord. There it is. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. It's gone and it shall not return. In Jesus' name. 
And this will be a sign to you that the Lord's hand is upon your life and that your direction needs to continue to walk closer to him. There's things he's calling you to set aside and leave behind. And, uh, and you've sort of done it and sort of not done it, but now the Lord wants you to fully rest and, and, and run towards him. And this, he heals you because he loves you, but he also wants you to know this is a sign that it's him that's been calling you. Does that make sense? Yeah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. Amen. Hi. What's your situation? Does it start in the back of your head? Show me where it starts. Did they? Go ahead. Have they found anything back there? Have they seen anything? So it typically starts on one side in the back and then it shoots around the front of your head and it's been going on since high school. Aren't you glad Jesus loves you and wants to heal you today? Isn't that good? Praise the Lord. We're just going to lay hands on you. Reach your hands out towards this precious child of God. In the name of Jesus, we come against this affliction, these terrible headaches and pains. In the name of Jesus, from the roots, we command you, you spirit of infirmity, to loose her and let her go. In the name of Jesus. Hmm. Hallelujah. You know, sometimes we don't even realize it, but we can open doors to uh, to the devil or other people when we're younger can open doors that can that can cause the enemy to have a foothold in our bodies. And uh, I just feel impressed, and I don't know, I, you know, we'd have to talk further, but I just feel impressed to lead you to renounce a few things. Would you do that for me? Okay. Just say, in the name of Jesus, I renounce the occult. And any dabbling I've ever done in the occult, in fortune telling, in astrology, any form of divination, any environments I've been in where that's happened, I renounce it all. Satan, take your hands off me. I'm a child of God. Amen. That's it. Praise the Lord. Now, devil, loose her and let her go. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Praise God. Praise God. Pastor Pascal, would you take a minute and just minister to her? I feel like there may be some additional ministry that would be good. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Father, we just give you praise and we thank you. We glorify you. We bless you. We thank you for moving to heal those people, Father, today. And this is your church. Have your way. Do what you want to do in our midst. In Jesus' mighty name, we leave room for you to do what you want to do. In the name of Jesus. So one more time, lift your hand up and let's just worship the Lord and thank him. Give him praise. Hallelujah. Pray for the Lord. 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 Pray for Praise God. Hallelujah. So can I just share something with you? This will be helpful. <clears throat> uh, you know, we've been talking, last Sunday we talked about the church being a dwelling place for God to call home, to move as he wants to move. And as we build that environment, you can go ahead and sit down. As we build that environment, uh, there's some there's some things that you can do to help the Holy Spirit to create an environment where the Holy Spirit can manifest. And so <clears throat> one of the things that happens in services when, when the Lord will say for myself or someone else, speak and begins to minister to individuals through what's called the word of knowledge. And, and I, you know, when I come up, I didn't know had no plan to pray for some folks or anyone with a condition. But as we open up to the Holy Spirit, those gifts operate and he shows us things. And so we'll call those things out and, uh, and, and then pray for the folks that are here. Sometimes we'll pray for them in their seats. And sometimes I feel impressed to call them forward and lay hands on them and pray for them. 
as we did today. And you actually, we felt that, that presence of God come upon all three of those people that we prayed for. Um, but what can happen is in the service, the people then get excited, which is wonderful. And, and sometimes we can start making a pull. Speak to me, give me a word. And, and let me tell you what it sounds like for me. I hear voices. It's like everybody, I feel the pull and all these different voices in my head. And so it's very difficult for me to know if that's the Holy Spirit or that's, you know what I'm, I'm not trying to be weird. This is Sunday morning. I would usually save this for a different environment, but that's okay. So what you can do when the Holy Spirit's moving like that, even if you're not familiar with it, is begin to pray for the person that's present. And sometimes we'll call for something and someone will, and the Holy Spirit will show us something and no one comes forward or raises their hand that we can see. And then afterwards, many times, someone comes up and says, that was me. I was just, I'd never had that happen before. I didn't know what to do. And they receive afterwards. Sometimes there's people watching online. But what can happen is, as you begin to see the Holy Spirit move, draw on him, not me. That's what I want to say to you. I'm just a conduit the Lord uses as he sees fit from time to time, but it's his presence in this place that you should put your faith on. And so what I'll do after I minister that way is I want to make sure that it's almost like entering into a room and you see this, there's this little gift here. So you open it up and you, and then you minister it. And then I'm in that room. So I want to look around a little bit and see if there's anything else. Does that make sense? before we go on with what we're planning to do next. So that's while I'll have you lift up your hands and praise the Lord. What I'm actually doing is I'm having you focus on him and not on me or what has happened, but focus on Jesus. And as we worship and praise the Lord, what it does is those poles on me lift because people are focusing on him. And then I can look around the room and hear clearly if I'm supposed to do something else. Sometimes I don't have anything else. So we just go on, right? This isn't a magic show right? I'm just a man, just, just trying to be led by the Holy Spirit. So, and so that helps me. So in the corporate anointing, when the Holy Spirit moves and ministers to some particular individuals in the church, you may have a tremendous need. You may have a need that's far greater than the perceived need of the person that's being ministered to. But even if your need isn't called out specifically in the service, uh, that doesn't mean the Lord doesn't see your need and can't meet it. There's so many instances where the Holy Spirit healed people as they sat in the services and listened to the word of God. So expect the Holy Spirit to move. And uh, when the spirit of God stops to talk and to minister to people like that, to care for them, just give the Lord praise and thanks. And and if the Lord wants to move in that way, especially, you know, uh, in your life, then we'll just believe God will give you exactly what you need. Sometimes, how many of you have, how many of you have ever come to church and you really needed to hear something from God? And there wasn't a prophecy or a particular supernatural, spectacular kind of thing. But as the as the word was being preached, or maybe the testimony for offering was given, the answer that you asked or you needed from the Lord came. So when you come to church, expect the Holy Spirit to speak to you. Don't just put a demand on the people on the platform. Thank God God's blessed us and given us gifts, but ultimately He's the superstar. He's the one that's in the house. He's here right now. He's here right now. He sees you. He knows you. He loves you. He's got gifts. He wants to pass out. Hallelujah. Just say, Holy Spirit, thank you for being here. Amen. One more time, lift up your hands. Let's worship the Lord. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Praise your name. We thank you, Father, for healing not only those we prayed for, but anyone else, Lord, that is here today that needs your touch. We believe, we receive in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Before we get into the word this morning, uh, there's uh, something I would like to do. You know, the scripture says to give honor to whom honor is due. And it's important to honor, the Bible says, honor those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord. And from time to time, there are folks, we've got a tremendous team at Abundant Life, wonderful deacons and elders and ministers and other and staff members who lead in this church. And uh, they do so many things we don't see, you'll never see, but uh, make many sacrifices so that God can bless you. 
And uh, today I want to take a minute to recognize and honor one of our team members. And uh, this week she celebrates 30 years of employment at Abundant Life. 30 years. I didn't even get to read all the stuff I got here. She she started as a volunteer. She worked with the children. She was an assistant to several of our executives doing whatever they asked her to do. She eventually moved into a leadership role in this church. She's taught classes, led mission trips. She was a youth leader as a volunteer, and then she served in in youth ministry as part of her job. She's been an events director. She's led the security team. And uh, today, she oversees Reach International Children's Home, our outreach in Bungoma, Kenya. She's the acting uh, executive director at Mercy Works, our nonprofit in the inner city. And she works with the rest of our executive team to help lead all the pastors and leaders here at the church. And I'm talking about Amy Carter. Uh, Amy has played an integral role in this ministry and its growth. She happens to be my sister. But uh, I can tell you, and anyone that knows her will know that she's not in this role because of nepotism. She has been faithful to the Lord and God has called her. You know, sometimes God calls families like he has ours. And uh, God called Miriam as much as he called Moses and Aaron, right? So uh, she, she was called of the Lord to work, and she's given her life to this church. And uh, 30 years of ministry, and we are very, very grateful. Her tireless commitment to our church and her compassionate leadership, her drive for excellence and to push, always push to the next level has helped us to become a better church. So I want to give a special appreciation and just an award today to Amy for 30 years of service to Abundant Life. Lisa, come on. So we have something for you. Your first award, there it is. Yeah. I never got one of these. Awesome. Participation. Yes. Yes. Awesome. You're welcome. We love you. Anything you want to say to this great congregation? I'll keep it short because I just got my voice back from the conference and Dion ruined it again in worship. So... Um, but uh, I was just, all the glory goes to God. I'm just his vessel. And I couldn't think of serving a better community of believers than the people of Abundant Life Church. I love you, you're my family. And I commit to every day leaving it all on the field for you and for the glory of God. Amen. We have some flowers for you. You can just kind of carry those around today. Yeah. Okay. That's it. Thank you. We love you. Appreciate you. Amen. You can be seated. Praise the Lord. If you see Amy, make sure to give her a big appreciation. She does so much in this ministry for all of us. Praise God. Well, how many of you brought your Bible with you today? If you have your Bible, hold it up and let's begin by thanking and praising God for the gift of his word. Father, we thank you for the word. We thank you that it is alive and it is powerful. Lord, we pray today that as we minister the word of God, you would speak to us, that Lord, you'd bring us on a journey like you brought your son Jesus when he entered this world, a journey into the presence of the Holy Spirit, a journey, Father, away from the distractions and the voices that uh, so often consume our time and our attention. And I pray, Father, that as we study these things today from your word, you'll help us to love and seek and desire 
an intimate relationship with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. If you have your Bible, I want you to open it up this morning to the Gospel of Luke. The Gospel of Luke, and we're going to talk a little bit today about the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. And, you know, we began last fall a series of things, teaching series of things that the Lord put in my heart when I was on, away on a mission trip. We talked about the local church. We talked about the power of the word of God. We talked about the power of your words, confession. We talked about um, faith and the importance of walking by faith. We talked about the gift of righteousness. We talked about the new birth, which you are in Christ as a new creation. But today I want to talk to you about probably one of the most important elements of your life as a follower of Jesus, and that is your opportunity to develop a personal relationship with the Holy Spirit. Turn to somebody and say the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, that wonderful person that Jesus sent from the Father to dwell with us, to be with us forever. And today we're going to take a look at the Holy Spirit's work in the life of Jesus. And we're going to take some time over the next 40 days to journey into a deeper walk, dwelling in the presence of God and seeking to hear from the Holy Spirit in our lives. Praise the Lord. So I want you to open up and uh, let's take a look here in Luke chapter, we'll begin in Luke chapter 3. Luke is the author of two books in the Bible, or two books in the New Testament in particular, and they're the two longest books in the New Testament, the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts. And uh, they, are, uh, they are both written by Luke, who was a physician who came to know Jesus after his resurrection and traveled with the Apostle Paul. As a physician, he was highly trained, he was educated, and he had access to all of the apostles. He had conversations with the mother of Jesus, Mary. He got to know all of the eyewitnesses that knew Jesus, and he got to experience the ministry of the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul as the church began to grow and explode throughout the Roman Empire. So when Luke sat down to write his two really part one and part two, story of Jesus and the church, uh, Luke had a unique perspective. He was, first of all, the most educated of all of the gospel writers. He was, had probably the most, uh, he has definitely the highest Greek of the New Testament writers of the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And Luke had keen powers of observation. And there are themes that are traced in the Gospel of Luke that are unique in certain ways that are even, he says things that aren't found in Matthew or, uh, or Mark and, and really not even in John. And the, one of the main themes of Luke in his Gospel and in the book of Acts is the theme of the Holy Spirit. You see the Holy Spirit mentioned from the very beginning of chapter 1. The Bible talks about the Holy Spirit filling Elizabeth and filling John the Baptist when he was in Elizabeth's womb so that he jumped. You find that when Jesus was born, the Holy Spirit came upon Anna and Zacharias and they prophesied. You see this, this emphasis on the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead moving in the life of Jesus. And so as Luke moves into the story of Jesus, he starts with the beginning. And Jesus' ministry began with an event that involved the Holy Spirit. And I want you to take a look at it with me. We're in Luke. Let's take a look in chapter, in, uh, chapter uh, 3. The, the Bible says that John the Baptist was preaching. And as he was preaching, he spoke about this gift that God was going to give to them. The people were hearing the messages of John, they were enthralled with him, and they really expected John the Baptist to kind of usher in 
the expected kingdom age. In fact, many of them thought that he himself might be the Messiah that was to come. And John had to clarify, I am not the Messiah, but I'm the forerunner to that Messiah. And so uh, John talks about it in chapter 3 and verse 16. It says, John answered saying to them all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one who is mightier than I is coming, whose sandal strap I'm not worthy to loose, and he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Everybody say he. Who's the he? No, read it carefully. There's one coming after me, John John the Baptist, who's mightier than I, whose sandal I'm not worthy to, to, to loose. He will baptize you, Jesus. John is prophesying that Jesus was coming and that Jesus would baptize. Now, John was baptizing with water, but there's one who's coming after me who will baptize, and notice these statements, with the Holy Spirit. And fire. Now, fire, we often, when we hear prophetic statements about fire, we think of hellfire. And the Bible does describe eternal separation from God as hell. And in numerous places, the Bible associates that with a torment like fire and flame. So that is a, that is a proper use of the word fire in some references. But more often than that, the word fire is used and fire as a metaphor is used in the Bible to describe the cleansing of the Lord, the refining of the Lord in our lives. And it is sometimes the fire of being in trials and tribulations or tests. The Bible says in the book of 1 Peter that our faith, which is more precious than gold, is tried by fire. And when you have something that's precious and you put it into the fire, you can put something into the fire to destroy it. But in this instance, you're not trying to destroy it because it's precious. You're cleansing it. You're purifying it. And I want you to get that picture because that's the image that they would have had this fire that cleanses and purifies. Now he goes on to say in a couple of verses that part of the fire that will come will also devour the enemy, so the chaff. But this is the idea. You've got wheat and chaff, and the chaff is the wasteful stuff, the stuff that isn't beneficial, that gets in the way of the wheat. So the chaff must be separated and burned. And so the burning of the chaff is really a symbol of purification, the taking away of that which is mixed with the holy, so that all that's left is the wheat. And you need to understand that when you become born again, you receive the righteousness of God. Your spirit is made right with him by the act of his grace through your simple act of true faith in what Jesus did for you. And that eternal life is placed on the inside of you and you're sealed with the Holy Spirit. Praise God. But that new birth, that new spirit is placed in a body and with a mind that has a lot of chaff. We talked about it a couple of weeks ago, right? Our body still has a nature to sin. Our body still is pulled by the the world, uh, by temptation, by the enemy. And so once we become born again, Now the plan of the Lord, after being justified or made righteous before God, is something called sanctification or the process of being purified, set aside for the Lord. And John is saying that when Jesus comes, he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And these two words are connected in the sense that when the Holy Spirit is upon you, you're baptized in him, there will be a refining in your life. That the baptism of the Holy Spirit burns away stuff that needs to be burned away. Amen. So there's some fire we want to avoid, like hellfire. And I want to avoid as many fiery trials as possible, except for the fact 
that some of those trials are designed by the Lord to make my faith stronger and to burn away the unnecessary distractions in my life. And we have to realize as Christians, that's part of our growth, is putting aside, after we come to Christ, the things that are distractions to our following Jesus. And I want you to see the Holy Spirit, John prophesied, was going to be that person that was going to come from Jesus. Jesus will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and this refining fire. So I want whatever this is, I want it. And you should too. Now, after John prophesies this, Jesus shows up to be baptized. Jesus is 30 years old. He's lived a quiet life in Nazareth, working in his father's shop, building things for the nearby city of Sepphoris, and uh, waiting for the moment that God would call him to begin his ministry. And when the father called Jesus to begin his ministry, he began by going to see John. And in verse 21, it says, Now when all the people were baptized... It came to pass that Jesus also was baptized. And while he prayed, the heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven saying, you are my beloved son, in you I am well pleased. So when Jesus was baptized in water, and this is amazing, here Jesus is mightier than John, But Jesus submitted to water baptism. That's why I like to say to people, listen, you don't get get saved by water baptism, but it is an an act after your conversion to demonstrate that you are a follower of Jesus. And if Jesus would submit to water baptism, who were you to not? Especially when he said to believe and be baptized. Baptism is something that we should do after we believe and know that we are lovers of Jesus We need to be baptized to follow the example of Jesus. Amen? The waters of baptism aren't the thing that saves us, but it's in that act of faith that we are baptized, and that baptism is a powerful moment that declares our separation from our past and our dedication to follow forward in Christ. So Jesus received baptism, and when he did, interestingly, he had an experience with the Holy Spirit. As he came out of the water, the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove. And there's a lot of questions about what this looked like. Some folks said it looked like a light that came down and floated and rested upon him like a dove would rest on someone's shoulder. It might have been, looked like a physical dove. Whatever the physical manifestation was, it was visible to everybody that was present. And when this, and, and this, dove-like manifestation when it sat upon him was the Holy Spirit coming upon him. Hallelujah. And he was filled with the Holy Spirit. Turn to somebody and say, Jesus had the Holy Spirit come upon him. Now from this time forward, Jesus begins to do miracles. Up until this point, Jesus performed no miracles. He's 30 years old. He didn't operate other than his teaching the, the, uh, the Pharisees when he was 12 years old in the temple, which we have a record of. Uh, other than that, we have no record of Jesus doing any ministry. He might, I'm sure he was caring for people, but there were no miraculous events occurring in his life. It wasn't until he was baptized in water and the Holy Spirit came upon him and that voice came speaking, you are my beloved son. From that moment forward, the Spirit of God was upon him. It was a moment of separation, a moment where the Spirit was now identified with Jesus. Now go to verse 1 of chapter 4, because we want to skip the the genealogies uh, are inserted here, but uh, there's no special anointing on the genealogies. So we're just going to go to to verse 1 of chapter 4. So verse 1 of chapter 4 immediately follows 3.22, and it says, then... Jesus. Everybody say, then Jesus. Then means after he was baptized in water and the Holy Spirit comes upon him. Then Jesus being filled with the Spirit. Now here we have another term. Filled. 
with the Holy Spirit. I want you to see these terms are sometimes used interchangeably in the Bible. The baptism with the Holy Spirit. In some cases, it's called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The same idea. Or being filled with the Holy Spirit is a description of what happens when a person is baptized in the Holy Spirit. I want you to notice that after Jesus had this experience, he was filled with the Spirit. Turn to somebody and say, being baptized in the Spirit will fill you with the Holy Spirit. So Jesus, being filled with the Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit. So he was baptized in the Spirit, which meant he was filled with the Spirit. And notice this next statement. He was led by the Spirit. Now listen, believer, when you're born again, the Holy Spirit comes within you. And he's there to guide you, to direct you, to lead you. And there are multiple dimensions of his presence in your life. And there are deeper places you can go, including this experience called being baptized with the Holy Spirit or filled with the Spirit. But I want you to know, when you are filled with God's Spirit, when you are in this deep connection with the Holy Spirit, you can expect to be led by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is promised to be a guide to the believer. Just like Jesus was now led by the Spirit, we who are filled and baptized with the Spirit should expect the Holy Spirit to lead us. Now, when Mark tells this exact same event, he renders it this way. He said, at this time, Jesus was driven by the Spirit into the wilderness. Luke says, led by the Spirit. Mark says, driven by the Spirit. What does that mean? When a person is living in a deep connection with the Holy Spirit, there is this sense of leading where he pulls us, but sometimes there's also a sense of the Holy Spirit in you driving you, like pushing you. And sometimes the Spirit's got to push you. He'd rather lead you, but if you're not going to follow, sometimes he's got to drive you. Have you ever had the Holy Spirit inside of you just sort of compelled you? You just feel your energy going in this direction, and if you don't do it, you feel like you're just absolutely going to be missing God? Praise God. I love being led by the Spirit, but I don't mind the Holy Spirit sometimes having to give me a little push as well. Praise God. Now notice where the Spirit of God is leading Jesus. It doesn't say that Jesus, being filled with the Spirit, was led by the Spirit into a great and mighty ministry. It doesn't say he was led by the Spirit or driven by the Spirit to preach to multitudes and heal the sick. The first thing that Jesus experienced after coming into this anointing of God upon him with the Holy Spirit is that that same Spirit that came to rest upon him and fill him, now led him, and what does it say? Where did the Spirit lead him? Into the wilderness. Now, those of you that have been with us to Israel know this wilderness. This is just outside Jerusalem, between the city of Jerusalem and the ancient city of Jericho, which is only about 20 miles, but it is a rocky descent from Jerusalem to Jericho, and that whole region is filled. It's just, it's a desert, but not like a sandy desert. It's like a rocky desert. And uh, this is the area that Jesus was driven to. People don't live there. To this day, this area, this area of Judea is considered to be really uninhabitable. There's a monastery that's in the rocks because early Christians recognized this is where Jesus went after he was baptized. But this was a very tough and difficult place. Mark says he was with the wild beasts. So there were wild beasts. And uh, Jesus, the wilderness is not like a restful place, like going to a desert spa in Arizona. Uh, the, the wilderness was a place of desolation. The wilderness was a place where there was no life. And the life that was there was often uh, it was often uh, difficult to cohabit with, uh, wild beasts. The, the, and, and so there was dangers in the wilderness. Uh, 
Sometimes in the wilderness there were robbers, but Jesus was in this wilderness and he was alone. Everybody say in the wilderness. Sometimes the will of God is to lead you right out of a powerful mountaintop experience into a wilderness to meet with you. The Holy Spirit wasn't leading Jesus into the wilderness to abandon him. He wasn't leading Jesus in the wilderness so that Jesus could just suffer. He led Jesus in the wilderness so that Jesus could have an unencumbered, undistracted period of time to get to know the Holy Spirit, to be with God. Remember this, when you are alone with God, you are not alone. And every one of us need to learn not just to be alone, because we need to learn how to be alone and not be alone. How we, how we can be alone and be in the presence of God. Everyone needs that. And so the Bible says he was driven into wilderness, or led by the Spirit into the wilderness, and being tempted for 40 days by the devil. And in those days he ate nothing. And afterwards, when they had ended... He was hungry. Everybody say 40 days. Oh, just do a little search in your concordance or a little Bible search on the word 40 and how significant this number 40 is in the word of God. Noah and uh, his family were on an ark, really above the earth, alone for 40 days and 40 nights as the rains came upon the earth. Uh, the Bible says that Elijah, after a great victory, was, down, was then being threatened with death, and he ran into the wilderness for 40 days to be alone, where he had an encounter with God. This number 40 is very, very significant in the Bible. So Jesus was alone for 40 days. And during this period of time, this wasn't the only thing that happened, but during this period of time, he was fasting, and it says he ate nothing. Now, I'm going to tell you, do not go 40 days without eating. This was a spirit-led fast for the Lord Jesus Christ. Most New Testament believers don't have to fast more than two or three days. Honestly, if you eat nothing for, for 40 days, I mean, you better make sure it's the Holy Ghost and not just, <laughs> right? But this was a spirit-ordained fast. And so Jesus ate nothing for 40 days. And the Bible says afterwards he was hungry. Now, he's still filled with the Holy Spirit. He's encountering the Holy Spirit. He's no doubt talking with his father, having adventures in the Spirit. And it was after this period of time in which he was fasting in the presence of God, setting aside things so that he could be focused on the Lord. It was after that that the devil came. Everybody say, the devil comes afterwards. And Jesus was vulnerable because the Bible says he was hungry. The end of verse 2. And the devil said to him, if you're the son of God, command these stones to become bread. And Jesus said, it's written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Jesus is also telling us something. He's telling us for the last 40 days, I wasn't eating physical bread, but I was eating the word of God. I was feeding on the word, and that was sufficient for me. So he dealt with the devil by speaking God's word. And then the Bible says in verse five, the devil took him up on a high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment. And the devil said to him, all this authority I will give you and their glory for this has been delivered to me and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you'll worship me, all will be yours. And Jesus answered and said to him, get behind me, Satan, it is written, Again, he quotes the word, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Jesus just quoted the word. You know, when the devil's tempting you, just speak the word to him out loud. It is written, sin shall not have dominion over me. It is written, great shall be my peace. It is written, the joy of the Lord is my strength. When he comes at your mind and your heart. Then he brought him to Jerusalem and set him on a pinnacle of the temple and said, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it's written, he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Now the devil's getting smart. Jesus is dealing with him with the word, so the devil pulls out the Bible. You need to know Satan knows the Bible. And those of you that have studied a while know that Satan is quoting Psalm 
91, which is the great promise of divine protection. So the devil says, hey, you know, if you're the son of God, you've got Psalm 91. His angels will give him charge over you lest you dash your foot against the stone. You're protected. You're safe. Why don't you go ahead and show how safe you are? And Jesus answered and said to him, it has been said, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Hallelujah. And so uh, that was it. And this says, when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. Now, I don't know if there was just three temptations. There's three mentioned. There might have been a lot more that happened. But every temptation that the devil had designed to try to test him was ended. And Jesus settled it by bringing the word. Now, I'm going to suggest to you that Jesus was able to deal with the enemy because he'd spent 40 days focusing on the Lord and the Holy Spirit. And he was in a position to be able to clearly deal with the enemy in, that was coming against him and his mission. And so the Bible says that after this was done, and I want you to notice this, verse 14, then Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit. Now, look at these phrases in just not even two chapters. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, filled with the Spirit, led by the Spirit, the power of the Spirit. This Greek word power is that word dunamis, explosive power, force and might. Jesus came back from this period of time, setting aside distractions, focusing on the Lord, and dealing with temptation in the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, when we really face the things we need to face with God's help and grace, and we win over those temptations or we defeat them, Satan loses ground in our lives. And the power of the Holy Spirit that's in us comes upon us. And we start operating in deeper and greater levels of God. And Jesus went on from there and immediately began to move in the Spirit. And if you just continue to read... It says he comes to Nazareth, and Jesus sits down. He brings the, a copy of the scroll in the, in the public worship assembly. This is Nazareth, his hometown. And he reads in verse 18, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down, and the eyes of all those who were in the synagogue were fixed on him, and he began to say to them, today this scripture is being fulfilled in your hearing. Notice, after Jesus has, these are very personal experiences. He's baptized personally. The Holy Spirit comes upon him personally. He's led by the Holy Spirit. He's with God in the wilderness, seeking God, fasting. He deals with the devil. He comes back in the power of the Spirit. All of these things are personal experiences with the Holy Spirit. But now he says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, not just for me, but he has anointed me to preach to set free, to deliver. In other words, when you and I allow the Holy Spirit to really have a deep work in our lives, it's not just for our benefit. It's to equip us and prepare us for our mission and purpose in life. We are called not just to be children of God, but to be witnesses for God. We're called to live in the power of the Holy Spirit, and every single one of us need to be experience this anointing that comes upon us to minister to people who are in need. Whether it's witnessing to your friends or praying for other people that are sick, I want you to know that the gifts of the Spirit don't just belong to pastors and prophets and apostles and preachers. The gifts of the Spirit belong to every believer. And if we'll seek the Holy Spirit and begin to develop a relationship with him, and we'll allow him to work in our lives, his anointing will be increased upon us so that we can minister more effectively to our generation. And if there's one thing that the body of Christ needs today, it is a fresh anointing of the Holy Spirit to minister. Now listen, this is important you hear this. We don't earn the anointing or the gifts of the Spirit. They're by grace. 
We receive them by grace. Jesus wasn't earning his salvation here. Jesus was already, you know, he was the son of God. He was anointed by the spirit, but he allowed the Holy Spirit to do a work in him personally that equipped him for greater ministry externally. Praise the Lord. Now this experience in the life of Jesus, recorded as you just read it in the Gospel of Luke, was early in church history recognized as a very important principle. As early as the second century, Christians began spending the 40 days leading up to Easter as a time of fasting and seeking the Lord. In latter times, it became known as, well, it was Lechen and then Lent, which simply means spring because it's the springing forth of new life. It's the spring season. But probably three quarters of Christians, Orthodox, Catholic, uh, mainline, most mainline Protestants, and some evangelicals recognize and devotionally spend 40 days leading up to uh, Easter or Resurrection Sunday, setting something aside and seeking the Lord, following Jesus in this pattern. It's very important you hear this. This isn't a religious ritual. I'm not putting ashes on your head. Okay, not that there's anything wrong with that per se, but I just, we're not, this isn't a religious ritual that saves you or makes you right with God. This is a devotional experience that you can choose to participate in with three quarters of the body of Christ, which is for the next 40 days, starting tomorrow, which will lead us right up to Resurrection Sunday, for the next 40 days, I want to invite you to go on a journey, a devotional journey with us in seeking the Lord and going deeper in the things of the Holy Spirit in your own life. You don't have to do this. It doesn't make you a better person if you do it. Are you listening to me? It's real important to hear this. It's by grace, not by works. It's not a works deal. This is a devotional exercise. But sometimes it's important for us to put disciplines in our life for a season so that we can take ground and get to a place where we're really refined, where certain things are set aside from our lives so that we can go deeper in the things of God. And so I want to invite you to go uh, on a journey with us to dwell in the presence of the Holy Spirit for the next 40 days. And this is an opportunity for you to do some exciting things that I believe are going to help you get clarified, refined, and help you to hear the Holy Spirit in a greater way in your own life. So, I'll give you the challenge, and you're free to pray and seek the Lord. But starting tomorrow, I want to invite you to begin a 40-day period of following Jesus, this devotional approach to what we, we call Lent. And here's what we're going to do. First of all, we're going to invite you to fast every Friday. Now, you could fast if you wanted to fast, you know, Monday or Thursday, but as a church family, we're going to set aside Fridays for the next 40 days, and we're going to fast from sunup until sundown. After sundown, if you want to eat with your family or rejoice, that's fine, but during the day, we want to fast and while we're fasting, which, you know, just drink water. If you have health issues, you may have to add something, but it's putting aside food, solid food for a day so that you can spend that time you would be eating in reflection and meditation and prayer. And I would encourage you that uh, every Friday when you fast, uh, take something before the Lord that you would like to see the Lord do in your life. And as you're fasting, Seek the Lord about that thing on that Friday. And it's just a way for you to begin to set aside your flesh and put away something, and uh, it'll be a blessing for you. Fasting has a powerful impact on the spiritual life of believers when it's done by faith. Amen. Second of all, I'm going to invite you to set aside. Everybody say set aside. Uh, when I say set aside, I want you to think of something in your life that for the next 40 days, you're going to surrender or set aside. Now, this is something that's very creative, and it's something that you need to follow the Holy Spirit in. But it, certainly you can set aside sin. But I want to talk about pleasures and distractions, 
Things that consume your time and your attention and your focus. Things that are going to hurt a little bit your flesh. And you're going to put them aside until Easter or Resurrection Sunday. And you're not going to engage in those things. I'll give you some examples. And by the way, it's a pretty powerful thing when you fast something for 40 days. You can fast television for 40 days. Now, there's no reason you have to watch your favorite show in the next 40 days because it's all recorded and available at any time. But if you, have, if you find yourself spending hours and hours in front of the television, it might be something for you to give up. What would it be like to not watch television for 40 days? It might be movies or media of some sort. It may be apps that are wasting your time. You might want to delete your Amazon app and all shopping apps for the next 40 days and decide that you're not going to buy anything extra for yourself, only your necessities and for other people. What would it be like to not buy another shoe for 40 days? No pants, no dresses. Well, not many people wear dresses anymore, right? Uh, but just, just, you know, something in your life that maybe is a habit or something that you do that for the next 40 days, you're just not going to do it. Maybe you're not going to go to Starbucks for the next 40 days. You're going to give up coffee for 40 days. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. You're not going to go to McDonald's for 40, no fast food, no restaurants. I'm not going to eat out for 40 days. Everything I eat, I'm going to prepare. It's a great way to become aware of what you're eating. For the next 40 days, I'm going to cut out a particular kind of food. I'm not going to have any sugar for 40 days. This isn't the same as fasting on Friday. This is like a set aside for this whole period of time. I'm not going to do it. I'm just going to set it aside. I'm going to see what my life is like without this. Without this, I'm, I'm going to delete Instagram for 40 days. Let me tell you something. For some people, that's way worse than coffee. I'm not going to touch alcohol for 40 days. I'm not going to drink a drop of alcohol. If that's, especially if that's something that you maybe imbibe. Uh, it, it's a good thing for you not to do it for 40 days. No desserts for 40 days. Yeah. Someone said, I need all of this. I'm doing them all. Well, I'm not recommending that. Pick one thing. One thing that it's between you and Jesus. And ask the Lord. This is where you get to invite the Holy Spirit. Lord, what would you like me to set aside for the next 40 days as I seek you and go deeper in my relationship with you? And whatever he puts his finger on, it should hurt a little bit. And you know what, some of you know right now what it is. And, you know, if it, the more it hurts, the more challenging it is, sometimes the greater the victory can be, right? I'm going to delete uh, this, or I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, uh, I'm not going to... Something that you find yourself spending time doing that is maybe a habit that you enjoy, but it's, it's something that you're going to set aside for 40 days. So find one thing to set aside for 40 days and make a decision to do it. Step number three. Everybody say step number three. We're going to have a daily devotion starting tomorrow, and it'll be published online, a daily reading from Psalm 37. So every day, this is the psalm the Lord gave us for the year. We're going to read pretty much one verse, in some cases half a verse, but we're in some cases two verses, but we're going to go through Psalm 37 verse by verse with just little snippets, and we're going to meditate on those statements, 40 statements from Psalm 37. And when we meditate on them, we're going to stop and think about what it's saying. What is it saying to me? Lord, what are you wanting? And just keep rolling the thought in your mind. Every day, you're going to have time with the Lord. You're going to open Psalm 37. You're going to read that little piece of Psalm 37 and let it sit in your spirit. And there'll be some additional thoughts that you can, you can, that'll guide you. And then I want to encourage you in your daily prayer time, to get a journal. 
We've got these dwell journals. They're great. They're in the bookstore. You, can, you might have one at home. But every day when you spend your time with the Lord, you're going to do your meditation in the scripture, your reading, and then write the date and just write to the Lord. Write a letter to the Lord. Uh, talk to God. It doesn't have to be long. It can be one paragraph. It might be three. But every day, write down what, you're, what you want to say to the Lord and listen. And if the Lord says something to you, Write that down too. I want you for the next 40 days to spend time with God every single day. You could do it in the morning. You could do it in the afternoon. You could do it in the evening. But take time every day to sit with the Bible, with a journal, read the word, meditate on it, pray, write out your prayer, and listen and see what the Lord says back to you. Very, very simple. How many of you can do that? We can do that, right? That's an easy thing. And watch what God is going to do in your life. Finally, the last part of this challenge, this devotional exercise, is we want to encourage you to connect with others. So find one other person sometime in the next day or two. Now, don't don't wait three or four days. I mean, get on it right away. Find Find your person, and the two of you are going to connect, and they're going to say, okay, over the next 40 days... We're going to talk at least once a week. And I don't mean a text, but a phone call or in person. We're going to connect and we're going to talk about what we're hearing from the Lord. When you find that person, tell them what you're setting aside. Tell them what you're believing God to do in your life to refine you as you fast. And then pray for each other as you devotionally uh, write out your journal and spend time with the Lord when you connect with that person once a week and make a schedule for it. Say, listen, me and Tom are going to talk. Tom, you're going to be my man, right? You're going to be my partner. Okay, what is a good date? Let's get it on the calendar and we'll talk for at least 15 minutes and we'll share with each other and pray for each other. This is something you and I can do. Anyone can do this. Find one other person to connect with and talk about what the Lord's doing in your life what you're believing for, and how you're doing as you set these things aside. Now, the question always arises, Pastor, if I give something up for 40 days, what happens if I indulge in that thing? Uh, what happens if I slip up? When you, what do you do when you fall down? You just get up. Write it in your journal. You know, and then say, and, and ask yourself, why was it hard for me to keep this commitment? Listen, doesn't make you, doesn't save you. But what you're doing is you're, ref, you're pulling some distractions out of your life so that you can focus on the Lord. And you might find some wrestling. You might find that the enemy comes against you. This is how you're, you're, we're going to wrestle with him in our lives so that we can intensify our relationship with the Holy Spirit. Amen. So I'm going to ask you to participate in this and believe with us and let's take this journey together as we continue to learn about the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. Have you been blessed by the word today? All right, let's stand up and give God thanks for his word. Again, all of the information will be at AbundantLife.Church and the devotional uh, readings will be up tomorrow and uh, everything I said will be online too. Father, we just thank you and praise you today for your word. We thank you, Father, for this Study in the life of Jesus, how he began his ministry. And Lord, I pray that you'd help each one of us, Lord, to have a deeper relationship with your Holy Spirit. That, Father, we'd come to know the power of the Spirit. That we'd walk in the baptism of the Spirit. That, Lord, the fruit of the Spirit would manifest in our lives. And that, Lord, we begin to manifest the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Lord, you gave us your Spirit to guide us, to teach us, to empower us, and to help us. And so, Father, we invite the presence of the Holy Spirit into our lives today in the mighty name of Jesus. I just say this, Lord Jesus, speak to me. What would you have me set aside? What would you have me seek you about? What do you want to do in my life? In Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. I believe he's speaking. All right, so before, listen, I'm telling you, before the day ends, get what, get your journal, right? Find your partner. Figure out what you're going to set aside. Tell somebody so you're accountable. <laughs> 
and let's begin together and see what the Lord's going to do in our lives. Amen? We love you so much. If you'd like to receive prayer for anything, if you'd like to know Jesus, these altars are open. As soon as we finish service, come forward. We want to pray with you. We've got a team of ministry leaders that are here to care for you and to help you experience everything God has for you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And may something great happen in your lives this week in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. God bless you. We love you. Wow. What an incredible experience. Now, I said this earlier, church just just doesn't happen on Sundays. So remember what Pastor was saying. And it's not about the person, it's about the Holy Spirit. So pick something to set aside for 40 days. I know for me, I'm probably going to pick social media because that's where I spend a lot of my time. But this is really an opportune moment, especially in the winter season for us in upstate New York, to set aside time for the Holy Spirit to come and dwell with us, to build that personal relationship. And listen, if you want to keep getting involved with Abundant Life, this was your first time here and you loved it, or if you want to find ways to get connected, go to our website, AbundantLife.Church slash dwell for all the ways you can get involved, all the events coming up. May the Lord bless you and keep you, and we will see you next week. Okay, I was like,